The last three reverses last week's losses with the Sensex and Nifty rising 2% each. The broader markets outperformed. So in this week's edition of Editor's Roundtable, we decode all the action from Dilal Street. We talk about the big promoter stake sales which continue through 2024 and we'll also put the spotlight on the action in the commodity space. I'm Reema Tendulkar, with me are Nimesh and Prashant. They're joining us on the show today. Uh, let me welcome Harsha Upadhyay, President, Chief Investment Officer for Equities at Kotak Mahindra Asset Management. Uh, Harsha, thank you very much for joining in and hi. Hi, hi boys. Guys, hi. Guys, hi. Uh, oh, I think, uh, Thursday. Huh? Huh? We have to have one day in a week which just zaps, you, zaps everybody, right? And that was this Thursday, uh, weekly expiry day. Yeah. And what a move, 500, 400 points in a single day. In and one hour, one and, and one a half hour. hour. And on a day when, uh, you know, uh, the calls, uh, Prashant highlighted in the morning as well, some crazy moves, right? Half a pesa call moved to 120 rupees and all. I mean, that's the kind of market we are in. And on the same day, we saw the FIs having the highest yeah. weekly uh, inflow on one single day, which is yeah. close to 5,000 crores. I'm excluding the block data. And still then they've put in 5,500 crores in a single day, which has been after a very long time. So, yeah, I mean, bulls are, having a, like bulls are having a great time. I was actually going to say that I think last week uh, or one of these days you had three we had three, three of us, right? Yeah. yeah. And somebody <laughs> sent Nimesh a picture saying it's a... Where, the round table where, is, where is the round table? It's a tri <laughs> triangle. So I think if, if Harsha was with us here, we could have probably... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, you know, I think next this week, coming week is going to be important and interesting also, yeah. right? Because... Uh, We've been, all of us have been sort of uh, beating the drum when, when will rates come down? Not just us, I mean, companies we speak to, fund managers, everybody's been saying, you know, we've had rates go up from 0 to 5%. Now, ulti ginti kap shuhogi, which is, I think it starts next week. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, I just want to quickly put out a few points. Uh, I think everyone is pretty well aware, it's very, very well advertised. The only now question is, uh, the rate cutting cycle will begin next week. And I think that's going to be the big talking point. Uh, and uh, can't get away from it. And in the anticipate, you can call it in anticipation or whatever, but the po point is markets globally, you look at India, you look at the US, everything, markets have really squeezed back to the higher end of the range, uh, which means in India, we've basically gone back to all-time highs. In the US, we're not again very far away. Uh, you know, you can s s say broader markets, etc. cetera, nowhere there, but the large caps, right? The large cap indices have done that. And you look at other markets as well. Uh, so risk has really come back in a very strong fashion as we go into this important, I mean, the first sign that rates, interest rates are going to start to come off. I have often wondered, uh, you know, if higher rates have not hurt markets, what will lower rates really mean? Can, can it provide it another... Be, it could be reverse, right? I mean, we saw the, every market going up in the up cycle. Yeah. And we've, we had in history as well that whenever there has been rate cuts, over a period of time, I mean, maybe a couple of months we can't count, yeah. but in general, we've seen a sharp uh, correction in the markets. After the rate cut, so maybe you, you know the again, interpretation is that I mean yeah. rates only go up when the economy is strong. Yeah. But sometimes rates this time went up because inflation was too high. Yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, so we, we'll see. I, so you know, so Fed will cut rates on Wednesday, which we'll react to on Thursday morning. I just want to put out this interesting thing, right? Is it going to be why? Why are we even saying whether it's going to be 25 or 50? Because last night there were two articles, one in the uh, Wall Street Journal and one in the Financial Times, uh, both sort of putting the question whether uh, it's going to be, it could be 50, whether 50 is still on the table or not. Now, uh, you know, some are saying, well, this is not a coincidence. This is the Fed telling the market and saying that, well, it's Maybe possible it's, it's 50. The market it. the market. Or as somebody messaged me earlier saying, well, this could be the market hustling the Fed yeah. to do a 50. Correct. You know, so it's possible. We don't know. But it's very much alive. That's the point that I'm making. And if they start with the 50, I mean, that's a, that's a big one. The general uh, understanding was that 25 is better because 50 would mean that the Fed knows something more, which is that, you know, maybe the economy is not such a good shape. It's more like an emergency cut. But we'll see. Uh, but in any case, because markets, as I began by saying, have done so well, uh, and all this talk of 25 and 50 has come in as well, that decision itself becomes a bit of a high volatility day. Because now there is about, there's a, uh, you know, is it going to be a miss? Is it going to be a beat? Is it going to be in line with expectations, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And of course, there is the whole market reaction after that. So, I mean, uh, in interesting times in that sense. Let's bring in Harsha with a quick view. Uh, Harsha has been, of course, cautious. Uh, he's uh, used various examples both here and locally to uh, sort of forcefully make his point. Points, I should say. Harsha, where are you at as far as markets are concerned? And how will rate cuts, what will they mean uh, for financial markets? 
Uh, Prashant, in terms of rate cuts, I think uh, more or less the consensus is uh, there is going to be a rate cut next week, and uh, most likely it is going to be a 25 basis points of uh, cut. So to that extent, uh, I think market is prepared for an interest rate cut. And uh, in the uh, run-up to the likely interest rate cut, we have seen markets also doing very well. So clearly the undertone, not just in Indian markets, but across markets, as you were highlighting the, at the beginning of the show, it's been very, very positive and bullish. Uh, yes, valuations have moved up, have continuously been on the higher side. So to that extent, uh, yes, one needs to be cautious, but I don't know what is the trigger which will uh, make the markets to realize that uh, we are at a high valuation at this point of time, uh, given the kind of uh, strength that we are seeing across uh, markets. Asha, we already gave you your cue. Next time, you've got to join us here uh, in the studio. We can't have this triangle going for us. <laughs> Yes, yes, I heard that. I'll be happy to. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, how are you positioning yourself, considering valuations in so many pocket in so many pockets of the market are very high? What are the changes that you've made in the last few months? Uh, Rima, as I would have spoken earlier as well, we do not keep too much cash in our portfolios, so we generally do not uh, take active cash calls. So, our cash levels are minimum. Uh, just to manage our uh, daily liquidity and a little bit of uh, portfolio. Uh, uh, Revamp. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we have been booking profits in uh, segments where we believe valuations are on the higher side, and also there are some uh, uh, slight negatives that are ahead of us in terms of fundamentals. For example, uh, in the auto space, we have cut some weight over the last couple of months, uh, especially in the passenger vehicle segment where we are seeing inventory building up and also discounts going up in the market. And we also believe probably uh, we have seen best of the margins uh, uh, for the sector. And the sector has outperformed during financial year 23 and 24. Uh, we believe that uh, 25 may not be as good as what the market uh, anticipated initially. So we have cut some positions there. We have also booked profits uh, uh, based on higher valuations and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, how recent outperformance has been in sectors like defense and industrials. So the money that we have raised from uh, booking profits in some of these sectors that I mentioned have gone into uh, slightly uh, defensive-oriented sectors such as uh, consumption and uh, IT, I would say, uh, where immediately we may not see a, a jump in earnings growth trajectory, but at least the valuations are not as expensive as uh, some of the sectors where we have booked uh, profits from. So overall, a slightly uh, a more defensive approach in the portfolios, I would say. Okay, so some profit booking in auto, uh, industrials and defense and money. Uh, that money has moved into uh, FM consumption and the IT names. But Hasha, you know, hold that thought because this is the year where we've also seen record promoter stake sales. Nimesh, uh, give us the numbers. Well, Rima, you know, it's a record year for uh, across, right? I mean, markets are at all-time highs. Commodity gold is at an all-time high, and so is the promoter uh, stake sale as well. So I'll just go to the wall and explain. But personally, also it's a high for me because I've completed 19 years this month in CNBC. Oh, yeah, so incredible. That, anyway, let me just go to the wall and explain uh, what the promoters and PEs have done in 2024. It's a kind of a record year, so to speak, in terms of the stake sale that the promoters and PEs have done this year so far. Uh, okay, this is the big, you know, big number that we are talking about. 4.75 lakh crore is the total amount of uh, stake sale which has been done. Promoters, P's as well as non-promoters. When I say non-promoters, someone like Bad gets included, where they sold for a 4% stake in ITC this year. So this been this has been the trend. Uh, in the last three years, it's been around 3.2 lakh crores. This year, Y2D, it still three months are left, and we've already crossed uh, 4.7 lakh crores. So maybe by end of the year, we'll have we'll be crossing 5 lakh crores in terms of the total uh, stake sale, which has been done by promoters, PEs, as well as institutional investors. So that's the kind of trend we've seen. Now, uh, the big deals which have happened this year, of course, Interglobe Aviation uh, you know, tops the list. There were two large blocks by the Ganwal family. They've raised close to 17,000, almost 18,000 crores. Indus Tower was another large block. Vodafone sold a big stake and raised 9,000 crores in a single day. Emphasis, big block by the PE investor, and they raised close to 7,000 crores. And even in Bharti Airtel, the PE sold close to a uh, stake worth 5,800 crores. So these were the large deals which have happened uh, this year, Vedanta, Ambuja, Simmons. Whirlpool was interesting. The parents sold a big chunk, 24% stake in Whirlpool India, and they rose close to 3,800 crores. So this was, these were the top 10 deals in terms of size that I'm talking about, which has happened this year uh, in terms of the promoters and peace stake sale. It's been a record year in terms of OFS and IPOs as well. I'll talk about the OFS first. 
in the OFS list, of course, uh, the, the government, uh, you know, government companies uh, top the list. Hindustan Zinc, there was a large OFS of 3,000 crores. NHPC uh, and NNC India were the other, th other two PSUs where the government sold uh, via OFS, and they raised close to 2,400 crores. Aditya Billa Sunlight was another company where the promoter sold via OFS. They raised uh, close to 1,500 crores, and Glenmark was another deal. So these were the few large OFSs. Now let's come to the IPOs. It was a record year for IPOs as well. 15,000 crores plus, and we are still counting in for this year. Hexacom was the biggest IPO for this year. In April, there is close to 4,200 crores. Other housing, Go Digit, Medi Assist, Eco, uh, Eco Mobility. There were a lot of smaller companies as well, which have raised between you know 600 to 1,000 crores or 1,500 crores in this year. Gopal Snacks, uh, Entero Health, uh, uh, Allied Blenders. The list is just goes on. I've just picked up uh, above 500 crore uh, fundraising in the IPOs as well. So as I said, you know, it's been a record year. As far as the P's and promoters take sale, almost at 5 lakh crores is what we've reached uh, Y2D this year, and it's been a record year. So, uh, Harsha, uh, if I want to ask you, you know, I'm sure you would have participated in some of those blocks as well. It's been kind of a, you know, wealth shifting from pr promoters and P investors to locals now through mutual funds, of course. What's been your call on, uh, on, the, on the promoters take sales, and have you participated in many of them? Uh, Nimesh, uh, yes, I mean, there have been so many deals during the year, definitely we would have participated in uh, some of them at least. And, and uh, yes, uh, we have participated. And uh, your data also includes a lot of IPOs that have been, uh, uh, that have come and gone during the year. So we, we definitely would have had some interest in some of them. Uh, but just a, a, a little different thought here. Maybe you need to bifurcate this uh, number into two buckets, one way. Uh, it was IPO and the uh, growth capital that was raised, which would have happened in uh, any case. So that we should uh, probably uh, keep it aside. And also in terms of the PE exits, uh, there are two kinds of exits. One who are exiting because there are uh, uh, there, there is uh, a higher valuation and they believe that probably this is the best time to exit. And also there are private equity funds which are exiting because their funds are coming to a closure. Right. So that's anyways a mandatory to uh, sell off at this point of time. So Correct. even if you make these distinctions, uh, you would probably see a couple of lakh crores of uh, promoters and PE, uh, which is uh, sold on a voluntary basis. And mm -hmm. that's where uh, it begs a question uh, whether the, uh, the public shareholders know more than uh, the people who are actually running the, the company or not. Only time will tell. But uh, today, it seems like even those stake sales have had very little impact on the market. And uh, probably uh, the valuations have been increased even after uh, all of those uh, offer for sale and and. and various stake sales. Harsha, maybe because some of that money is coming back to uh, fund managers, right? <laughs> Probably to you. <laughs> to, I mean, so, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's coming the back into coming the market. Back, right? Right? Through, uh, yeah, of course, through uh, family offices and putting money into mutual funds. Yeah, maybe it's getting a little diversified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Away from just one single uh, stock, right? I mean, the company you already own. Uh, investors uh, uh, likewise. You know, it's interesting, Nimesh, you started with 2020, right? Yeah. Uh, mm. 20 is when, I think the... COVID. The, was a, we got the string of deals, it was 2021, G, 20, the GEO, the deals. 21, 21, 22 was, was when we saw, uh, which is why, you know, Back 21, to back all those deals which yeah, happened. So 21, 20. 20, 23 was I average. I thought it was 2020. I thought it was 20 uh, when... Uh, uh, it started, uh, kicked off in 2020, went but, into all the way to 21. Maybe, yeah. That actually was the, was the in a way, point. it kicked it off, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not, uh, we've not looked back since. Depths of COVID, and I think the number for 2024, as Nimesh uh, sort of put out, is literally double of what we saw uh, back in uh, 2020. Well, we'll take a quick commercial break here. We're going to come back and uh, we we'll look ahead into the uh, new week. We're going to also ask uh, Harsha about a few sectors, jewelry stocks, Bajaj housing. Uh, Reema will sort of uh, talk about this one in greater detail and more. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're with us here on Editor's Roundtable. Uh, and, you know, we've been talking about stocks and, uh, you know, globally what stocks have done. But commodities is the other uh, piece of the pie, which has done phenomenally well. I was looking at data, Reema, from the yeah. 5th of August, that panic low. I was looking yeah. at asset classes and commodities and gold in particular has mm -hmm. done phenomenally well. Oh, absolutely. But let me start with crude because yeah. that stole the spotlight at the beginning of the week. On Tuesday, Brent crude prices slipped below $70 per barrel at a three-year low. So um, that was the headline. 
Brent crude below $70 per barrel. After that, it recovered through Thursday and Friday. And for the entire week, you know, crude prices did end with gains. And there were many factors at play. Uh, so, for instance, OPEC cut the demand forecast for the second time uh, in two months. Uh, there is weak Chinese data, which hurt the sentiment. Uh, the transition to EVs and cleaner fuels is also hurting demand. But then on Thursday and Friday, with that recovery, it was also Hurricane Francine, which impacted uh, supplies. But on Friday, we had gold prices going on to hit record high levels. So the international spot gold prices crossed 25, uh, 60 an ounce. Uh, and the low earlier this year was about sub 2000. So it's been a fabulous move. Uh, and, you know, I was just checking the annual return for in the Indian uh, currency uh, for the MCX spot Indian price. Uh, in the last nine years, there's only been one year where gold has actually given you a negative return. Other than that, in eight out of the last nine years, gold has actually given you a positive return. Return. And if you look at the, you know, CAGR, five years, ten years, they've actually matched that of, uh, you know, equities. So jewelry companies uh, did very well. So this week we had a near 40% plus gain on TBZ. That's Tribu Vanda, Zaveri, Moti Sons moved up 35, 40%. Kalyan Jewelers was a big one, a big double-digit up move. Senko, Titan also closing up in the green. So some of the, you know, factors driving the up move: one, higher gold prices; two, there is a PN Gargil IPO. Three, many companies are talking about how the demand outlook uh, you know, in this, for the second half of the year is actually better than what they had earlier anticipated. We even spoke to Crystal and they said that you know uh, the weddings this year are turning out to be a lot bigger than what they were. Uh, so demand is you know, picking up on the sideline. But just bear in mind, as you know, Mangalam was telling us earlier, that most of the larger companies like, say, a Titan are fully hedged. So they may not benefit from the rise in gold prices, but some of the smaller mid-cap, small-cap gold jewellery companies could benefit because they've not hedged, so they can enjoy the rise that we've seen in gold prices. So commodities, both crude and gold, you know, stole the spotlight this week. Harsha, do you own any jewellery companies or at least the larger, you know, large caps or the large mid-cap players? Prima, yes, uh, we do own uh, some jewellery names in our portfolios. Uh, we have been positive on this space. I think uh, clearly gold prices have been on an uptrend. And also one of the bigger uh, overhang, uh, overhangs that were there for the uh, industry, uh, which was about import duty, and that's also partially behind us. Uh, there is no reason to believe that there cannot be another import duty cut uh, next year or in the next subsequent uh, few years. But at least a large part of that cut has already happened. So whatever hit had to happen has happened. So at, at these prices, I think uh, uh, one can be positive on gold and uh, thereby I think uh, the jewelry demand will also probably inch up. And uh, anyways, as you get into second half of the financial year, you will see festive season coming up and a uh, lot of weddings coming up. So overall, I think this space is going to uh, really see a better demand uh, uh, trends in the second half as compared to first half. And uh, hopefully the stock should also uh, do uh, better than what they've done in the first half. Hmm. Arsha, uh, what's your view on uh, within financials uh, on NBFCs and housing finance companies? We have a big listing on Monday in uh, Bajaj Housing Finance. Uh, and the city is anticipating that you know strong listing would lift uh, the other uh, valuations of others as well. Uh, and also there's an anticipation of rate cut in second half, which could mean uh, NBFCs could do well. Your view, your view on both the sectors, NBFCs as on housing finance companies? Uh, between housing finance and NBFCs, we prefer diversified NBFCs and they offer a lot more uh, uh, diversified loan book as well as through cycles, they have done better than monoline businesses. Uh, and and uh, in case of uh, uh, interest rate uh, uh, trends and, and the likely impact on the uh, lending businesses, clearly NBFC companies will have an advantage when interest rates uh, decline. And we believe that in the second half, uh, that's likely to, going to be the scenario. Although this time around, we may not see very sharp interest rate cuts in the country uh, unless something unforeseen comes and hits us. But it's going to be a very shallow interest rate cycle. But nevertheless, it's going to benefit uh, NBFCs. Uh, so to that extent, yes, uh, we do hold uh, uh, some, some of the diversified NBFCs in half of the uh, no, got that. So diversified NBFCs rather than sort of housing finance. Uh, and yeah, I mean, NBFCs are diversified. There's no sort of sector champion now. Everybody does everything. Arsha, on gold finance, you said valuations are now uh, unpalatable or you, you, you still like some of them? Just to complete that uh, point. Companies, I said... Uh, the Sorry, go trends. gold companies, jewelers, not gold finance companies, jewelers, yeah. Yeah, on jewelers, uh, we are positive at this point of time as we believe okay. the demand trends will uh, pick up in the second half. And uh, most of the negatives around the gold prices are also behind us with uh, 
import du uh, duty cut already behind us. Mm. Okay. Hasha, and, uh, sorry. Yeah. You, you said uh, IT and consumer were two pockets which you were comfortable with. In consumer, can you, uh, what exactly are, we, are you talking about? Consumer discretionary? Uh, until very recently, we were uh, overweight on consumer discretionary rather than uh, FMCG or consumer staples. Uh, mm -hmm. But off late, we have built some positions uh, which are more rural dependent and mass oriented. Uh, we believe that uh, the monsoon season has gone uh, quite okay. And hopefully, uh, with some lag, we should see pick up in uh, rural consumption trends as well. So we have added uh, some of the consumer staple names uh, into our portfolio as well. So overall, on on uh, consumer discretionary as well as staples, now many of our portfolios have an overweight. Just a quick word, uh, pharma is not a part of your portfolio because pharma stocks have done very well. The earnings have been strong. We do hold pharma as well. Uh, pharma has been a good performer as well. And uh, maybe a couple of quarters back, there was a lot more valuation comfort on the pharma names. Uh, uh, and nevertheless, even now, we believe that earnings growth by and large should sustain, uh, which is going to be slightly higher than what the market average earnings growth would be for this sector. Uh, so to that extent, uh, we continue to hold uh, an equal weight to slightly overweight position on uh, pharma at this point of time. Asha, great conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy your weekend. It's curtains down on another edition of Editor's Roundtable. But next week is a big one, the Bajaj Housing Finance IPO and the Fed rate decision. Keep it with CNBC TV 18.